Hello, I'm Kay Jacobson with Ramsey County Library, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's talk, which is part of the 2024 Tuesday with the Scholar series. Our speaker today is Henry Berman, and our topic is Iran versus Saudi Arabia, and this week we are focusing on Saudi Arabia. First, I'd like to start with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and Ramsey County Libraries are built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose lands we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with our tribal nations. So Henry Berman has an MBA from Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth College, and he's worked for 34 years with Echo Labs, but is now retired. Henry has been a member of the Great Discussion Speakers Bureau and has led many OLLI classes on global affairs and history. So at this point, we'll turn things over to Henry. Thanks, Henry. Thank you, Kay. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. I appreciate very, very much your interest in this topic. We're going to cover Saudi Arabia today. That'll be the main focus but we'll also try to reference uh, its ongoing on again, off again conflict with, uh, with Iran as, uh, as we move along here. First of all, let me get to uh, share screen. Okay, here we go. Iran versus Saudi Arabia. I'm gonna start with a little anecdote, which I think kind of tells it all. When it comes to how the United States, the relationship with uh, with Saudi Arabia has transpired over the years, Barack Obama in 2016 had this very lengthy interview with Atlantic Magazine just prior to him leaving the presidency, and a question was posed to him, which I thought was very telling. His response, at least, was very telling. That question was, Mr. President. What's the deal with Saudi Arabia? Uh, are they our friends or not? And he paused, seemed like he looked up for about 10 seconds, didn't say a word. And then he said, it's complicated. And it truly is complicated. Truer words have never been spoken. This relationship is quite unusual. Uh, Saudi Arabia is only one of 190, 195 countries in the world but it has some very, very, very unique attributes, and it has had a major impact on the global scene, particularly in the, uh, uh, in the last uh, uh, many, many, many uh, uh, decades. First of all, Saudi Arabia is the first, the only country in the world that was created by one family, and it was actually even named after one family. Hang on, I'm gonna try to, here we go. This is the original, the formal name of Saudi Arabia. Very few people use it, but this is the formal name. The Arab Kingdom of the House of Saud. Now, what does that say? First of all, it's very interesting to me. Iran has in its name, the Islamic Republic of Iran. So its connection to Islam is its primary uh, 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 focus. But in Saudi Arabia, it's all about the tribe, the ethnicity, the tribe, the house of Saud. This is what the, the primary uh, 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 focus is, is on the house of Saud. It's all about the tribe. And this is where Mecca, the capital point of, uh, of, of uh, the, the main focal area of Islam is located in Saudi Arabia. And it is actually a pillar of Islam that once in one's lifetime, you should go to Mecca, make a pilgrimage to Mecca. So with that, let's uh, move on here. The outline, this outline is somewhat similar to last week, only a few minor differences. We're gonna talk a fair amount about geography uh, and we'll talk about demographics. We'll talk about the unusual kind of governance in uh, in Saudi Arabia, we'll reference very briefly their history, uh, their foray uh, and conflict from time to time, back and forth with radical Islam. 
And then also finally close out with what are the issues that we need to watch, whether we should be mindful of uh, in the future ongoing as we're watching the uh, uh, the various events of the Middle East unfold with respect to, uh, to Saudi Arabia. Uh, I would say there are three primary influences that drive Saudi Arabia and have historically. Number one is the royal family. The royal family, when you say governance in Saudi Arabia, you are talking about the royal family. Um, it is as pronounced a kingdom, a dictatorship with a monarch as any other country in the world. Uh, the second is Islam. Islam, uh, the center of Islam, took place where the Saudi Arabia currently is located. Uh, Muhammad uh, grew up and lived in this area of the world uh, approximately 1,400 years ago. And uh, in, this is a primary driver of the entire uh, ethic and society of Saudi Arabia. Thirdly, that three-letter word, oil. Uh, oil has been uh, provided Saudi Arabia with just some spectacular amount of wealth. It has the geopolitics of the world change when oil was discovered in the Middle East. It has impacted all our lives, as you all know. And uh, uh, we'll talk about that on again, off again uh, throughout the next hour or so. So with that, let's move on. Let's talk about the geography of Saudi Arabia. First of all, Saudi Arabia size-wise is the largest country in the Middle East. It's uh, the second largest, by the way, is Iran, size-wise. Uh, Saudi Arabia um, is about 60% of the lower 48 states in the United States. It's extremely, extremely large. Uh, it is called the Desert Kingdom. It's called that for a reason. It has, um, it has uh, literally, despite its size, no rivers or lakes in the entire country, not one. Uh, there are three primary sections in Saudi Arabia. The middle section from top to bottom is all desert. Uh, it's primarily the Arabian desert, which is considered the largest desert on the planet. It goes all the way up to the northern border. Uh, much of that desert is unexplored and uninhabited and uh, uh, has just simply, people there have not lived much differently than uh, since the land of uh, uh, Abraham. So uh, very, very uninhabited. The only exception to that is Riyadh, which is right in the center. You can see it. Uh, adjacent to the I and the word Saudi. Riyadh is the capital. The reason it's the capital is because that's where the founder of the country, Abdul Aziz, uh, was, um, what Ben Saud was, uh, lived, and that was his original home. So that's the center area. Um, another section is on in the east. In the east is just south of Kuwait going down towards where it's labeled Bahrain, this is where all the oil is. This is where the oil is uh, in Saudi Arabia. It's primarily along the Persian Gulf. And um, there are other countries, the Gulf states of Bahrain, Qatar, you can see there also the United Arab Emirates have lots and lots and lots of oil along that area. Interestingly, right across the Persian Gulf, in Iran is where all of Iran's oil is located, which is what makes this such a source of, of, of friction. Because were there ever to be a battle and they took out each other's oil fields, uh, this could truly wreak havoc on the whole world's oil supply. If you would throw in Iran, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and the oil in Qatar and also United Arab Emirates, um, that represents something like 70% of all the oil, uh, the global supply of oil, 70%. Now, moving on the other side, oh, one other thing about the east, this section. In this smaller section, 
of Saudi Arabia is where the Shia minority population lives. The Shia minority population, the majority, approximately 90, 92% of the population are Sunni Muslims. There is a small Shia Muslim population, and they are along the uh, same area where the oil oil fields are. Now, on the uh, a western side, this side here is the area that used to have a country called Hejaz, and this was the section along the Red Sea, up and down along the Red Sea, that was once part of the Ottoman Empire. This is where Mecca is. You can see Mecca there, hopefully. You can, uh, uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but there's where Mecca is. Mecca is the center of of uh, Islam globally. This is where people make pilgrimages every single year uh, uh, throughout the years to uh, Mecca. And then just um, directly west of Mecca is a very, very large city called Jeddah. Jeddah is a large metropolitan city, has a large metropolitan uh, airport. It is about 30, 40 miles from Mecca. This is where now people fly in to come to Mecca. Interesting, the roads, the highways between Jeddah and Mecca were built by Osama bin Laden's father, uh, who built lots and lots of roads throughout Saudi Arabia over the decades. And uh, one other aside, interestingly, of Jeddah is that they are currently building the uh, what is uh, purported to become the tallest building in the world. Uh, it is not done yet. It was started about 10 years ago. It's expected to be done sometime in the next five to 10 years. Who knows? When it is done, it's going to be an entire kilometer tall. It's expected to be over 200 floors, and it will be twice the size of the Empire State Building. Okay? So that is Jetta. A uh, couple of other things here on the map I want to point out. Uh, waterways. Uh, Adjacent to Jeddah is the Red Sea. The Red Sea is primarily known for uh, from the Bible. Uh, Moses uh, putting out his hands and dividing the Red Sea. Uh, interestingly, today it is a very, very busy waterway uh, because it's the connection point between the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean. Down at the furthest southern tip point is the Bab el Mande uh, Strait. It's like a choke point here. It's only about 20 miles wide. And uh, in this southern area, there has been a lot of friction and conflict because the Houthis, which control Sana, the uh, capital of Yemen, have been firing on Western ships as a part of the uh, Gaza War. And in the northern part of the Red Sea, there are two prongs. There's one prong that goes up to Aqaba by Jordan and a lot in Israel. And then uh, on the other side, whoops, I have to move that back. Uh, on the other side is a community at the end of that prong called Suez. And from there, a canal was built from there to the Mediterranean to Port Said that was 125 miles long. And that was built in 1870, known as the Suez Canal. And because of its connection point, but enabling uh, the Indian Ocean to get to the Mediterranean, it has been very, very prized and coveted for many, many years, uh, up until 1956 by the British the Suez Canal. Now there's one other waterway I wanna highlight, and that's the Persian Gulf. Interestingly, Persian Gulf is not called the Persian Gulf in Saudi Arabia, because they don't like each other, remember? It's called the Arabian Sea, okay? It's called the Persian Gulf by most of the rest of the world and by Iran. But in Saudi Arabia, it's called uh, uh, the Arabian Sea. Persian Gulf, as I said, 70% of the oil supply goes through the Persian Gulf, and it goes to, to get to the Indian Ocean uh, through this choke point called the Straits of Hormuz, H-O-R-M-U-Z. And uh, from there, it goes to the uh, 
the Gulf of Aden and then to the Indian Ocean. And primarily it goes either up through the Arabian Sea, through the Red Sea to the Mediterranean, to Europe, or directly uh, east towards India and China. Very, very important waterway. If you look at the totality of this map, there are lots and lots of land borders and water borders. And they generally are pretty porous uh, because the border, particularly in the South is all, um, it's, it's all desert along there. It's very, very porous. And so this does create a security threat for the country of Saudi Arabia. Okay, next. Let's talk about demographics. First thing about demographics, statistics in Saudi Arabia are notoriously unreliable, unreliable. So having said that, the number of residents, this includes citizens and foreigners, are approximately 33 million residents in Saudi Arabia. Remember that in Iran, where it's actually smaller physical size, the Number of residents is more like about 88 million. So um, it's very, Saudi Arabia is sparsely populated because of its desert, large amounts of desert. Of the 33 million, only 19 million are Saudi citizens. Only 19 million. 12 million are non Saudi workers. The Saudis just don't want to do that type of menial labor as far as picking up the garbage, as far as being chambermaids. Uh, in some cases, even nurses uh, in hospitals, uh, they hire out and get workers from countries like Bangladesh, India, Philippines, Egypt, uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, countries like that. A lot of other African countries come to Saudi Arabia to work. There also are 2 million, approximately 2 million uh, Westerners, uh, people from uh, the United States, from uh, Europe. These people primarily are petroleum engineers and they work and help in the oil fields. We'll talk more about them and how that works in a little bit. Women in Saudi Arabia, most, most interesting story. 42% of the population of, of, the, uh, of Saudi Arabia, the citizenry are women. 74% uh, of university students are women. 74%. It was only 25% in the year 2000, and now it's 74%. It's a very interesting dynamic, and it's causing problems, because what the Saudis are doing is they seem to be willing to invest and open up uh, colleges for women and invest in their education. But if you look down underneath, only 30% of the labor force is women. It has indeed doubled in the last five years, but they're not finding enough jobs for women in the workplace, although they're educated. Consequently, 56% of women listed as unemployed have college degrees. And, you know, any time that uh, you have a country which has such a large percentage of its worker for workforce that are not citizenry of that country, it can be a very dysfunctional situation economically and to a certain extent, um, uh, very unstable. And why is it that uh, Saudi Arabia can pull it off? Simple, oil. Um, one last thing, and we'll talk about this uh, uh, issue of women in just a minute. Uh, also, in the Middle East, this is a phenomenon throughout the Middle East, there's a very high proportion of uh, young people Okay, uh, the highest proportion of young people is truly in Iran, actually. But in Saudi Arabia, it's high as well. 70% are under 35 years of age. And this really impacts the voting phenomena as well. So with that, let me talk a little bit backtrack about women in this system called guardianship, which is absolutely horrible. It's What's curious is the, the issue with women in society is different than in Iran. As you may recall, last week in Iran, I mentioned in Iran, the women can vote, they can be in parliament, uh, they can drive, 
The only thing that's an issue, which they strictly adhere to, and they have a morality police for this, is the dress. They need to have their entire body covered except for their face and the tips of their hands. Okay? Very different in Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, um, the clothing is not as restrictive, but they cannot, they, the amount of jobs available in the workplace are limited. Uh, they're just starting to be able to drive uh, now more than ever before. And um, uh, as a general rule of thumb, there's a system called the guardianship system, whereby every woman within their family has to have a designated guardian who watches over them. They're surveilled by a male relative. It can be the father, it can be an older brother, it can be a husband. It literally causes them to have a lifetime of slavery. They can be abused at the whim of a male. Uh, interestingly, the sexes never mix in a public place after kindergarten. A man and a woman uh, who are not married cannot be together outside in a public place. Uh, it was a situation where they could not drive. Interestingly, the uh, the current leader, Mohammed bin Salman, we're going to talk about him in a few minutes. Uh, he is um, he has started to dissolve and wants to decapitate and end the guardianship system. He's officially done that, but the fact of the matter is every single household is modestly different. And as a result of that, it's very, very plausible that in an individual household, it could still be uh, be executed, okay? So uh, one other little scenario, which I think is just crazy uh, 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 from Saudi Arabia, that uh, uh, a little story, a little anecdote. Um, an, an architect, who was then in his 70s, was interviewed about 10 years ago. He told a story that's really stuck with me. He said he was um, he was asked to design a large office building in the 1970s. 1970s, not that long ago. We remember the 1970s. He was asked to design a building in the 1970s. And the building was 14 stories high. 14 stories high. That's pretty big. It's not a tiny, tiny place. 14 story high office building. And what he said was not one place in that office building was there an accommodation to be built for a woman's restroom. Not one place in an entire office building. Now, he cleverly said that uh, what he did was he created a warehouse and a sp specific spot on each floor, knowing that that could be a place that could be transformed into a woman's restroom at some point down the road. But I found that story just amazing that this just wasn't in the minds of Saudi society as recently as 1970. Okay, so moving on. Let's talk about so Saudi society briefly here. There's a historic social contract in Saudi Arabia, which has nurtured a loyalty to the royal family, okay, in exchange for cradle to grave services. Now, um, it's not even really so much a loyalty as a passivity. The people just very much accept it because it's a good deal for them. What are those cradle to grave services? Free education, free health care, free water and activity electricity, no income tax, low cost energy. It is said that the cost of gasoline is something like 15 cents a gallon. They all get guaranteed comfortable state jobs. So they have a pretty nice life and they are very accepting. And because of that, because of all they're given to them, because of their wealth, the populace is really not craving for democracy. So um, all this talk, every once in a while you hear stories in uh, Saudi Arabia, maybe the uh, royal family is going to get overthrown. But you know what? With all of these services, I don't see it happening anytime soon. General lifestyle of Saudi Arabia, uh, their real focus is conformity. 
everybody is the same. No independent type of uh, of of, uh, of lifestyle or anything like that. There are large walls between each uh, each home in Saudi Arabia, by and large. Uh, the people, I think, they live very sedentary, stationary lives. They're kind of couch potatoes. Uh, seems like they never really take walks. They don't walk. The heat's horrible. Uh, they always drive from point A to point B. Uh, it is said that 13% of Saudis exercise. 13%. They exercise more than one hour a week. Just one hour a week. Needless to say, should be no surprise, 70% um, of adults are obese in Saudi Arabia. Okay? Going on to the next uh, slide. Let's talk a little bit about the royal family in a little more detail. They are truly the glue that holds the country together. There is a king. Uh, he's probably the most pronounced, powerful in an individual country, king, monarch of any country in the world. There is a parliament. It's not very robust. It doesn't make a lot of decisions. The king makes the important decisions. There's no trade unions. The royalty, the royal family makes all those decisions. It's the military is kind of apolitical. Um, by and large, the royal family is very secretive. They're very paranoid. They run the oil company called Aramco. Uh, it represents 80 to 9 percent of the 80 to 90 percent of the gross national product in the country itself. Uh, the stability, regime stability rests on succession, management succession, a process, and also rests on their fabulous wealth. Okay. Uh, seniority has historically dominated things. We'll talk to that in a few minutes. And when I look at the core national interest for the monarchs, what do you think it is? As with most dictators, survival. It's as simple as that. That's their core national interest. This is the king of Saudi Arabia, King Salman bin Abdulaziz. King Salman bin Abdulaziz was the, uh, um, the king, became king in 2015. He is now in his mid to late 80s. Okay, he's very conservative. He was the 25th son of the original founder, Abdulaziz. All the previous leaders, there have been six of them, since Abdulaziz died in 1953, there have been six sons that have in succession become the king, okay? And he is the uh, the sixth one here. Um, next, the next, there's going to be a huge transition starting when he passes away because he has decided and got an agreement from everybody that the next uh, leader is going to be his son. So it's going to move to a new generation after he dies. And the leader is going to be Mohammed bin Salman. Mohammed bin Salman, what everyone in the world refers to him as MBS. He's referred to as MBS. Okay. He is um, 38 years old. He's the crown prince. He has several hats right now. He wears several hats. He's the prime minister. He runs Aramco, the oil company, which means he runs the economy. He's responsible for all defense-related decisions, okay, and, uh, uh, and and probably more things that I have uh, I have forgotten about. Okay, what uh, uh, a little bit more about him. He is just 38 years old. He'll be 39 at the end of next month. Um, he is probably going to be the leader of Saudi Arabia for another 40 to 50 years. So uh, we better get used to having him around and getting to know him. He's the firstborn son of the king's third wife. And he started to go to meetings with his father at age 12 years old. He's never lived outside the kingdom. He's never mastered a foreign language. And he's never really learned diplomacy. This is highly unusual. Most crown princes, most princes in Saudi Arabia went to college in the West. And most all of them speak fluent English. Um, he got a BA in law at Riyadh University. And his father became king in 2015. And 
2017 is where he jumped ahead and started taking on lots and lots of additional responsibilities. Um, next thing, Vision 2030. I wanted to talk in a little level of detail about this. This is a very, very important uh, initiative that Mohammed bin Salman is, uh, has uh, forged ahead with. Mohammed bin Salman, by and large, has done, uh, his verdict has been very mixed. He's done some horrible things. He's done some very wise, astute things. Uh, this is one of his astute things. Uh, what he is, wants to do with Vision 230, and he says he wants to do this by two, uh, 2030, but nobody believes that'll, that'll happen. His objective is to transform Saudi Arabia into a diverse modern society. That is another thing of saying to divest Saudi Arabia from just from oil, from being so focused and dependent as it is now on oil. Now, I think this is a very admirable uh, venture that he'd get into. And frankly, in my humble opinion, countries should have done this 40 years ago. They should have started this in the 1980s. But now is now, and they were too uh, happy just uh, being as wealthy as they were and letting the money just come pour in, pouring in. Uh, what they want to do, uh, Ben Salma, to his credit, believes in a market society. He wants to broaden that economic base beyond oil and build up, for example, tourism. There are right now many beautiful new uh, museums in Riyadh and Jeddah, and uh, they, they're empty. They have no, uh, no people visiting them. Very, very few. Uh, they want to build up tourism in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Technology-wise, they wanted to get as much technology to advance and move their, uh, their economy forward technologically. Uh, this is one of the reasons they're so interested in normalizing with Israel. More on that a little bit later. They want to transform culture, uh, bring Western culture in more. Uh, the one thing that is taking place right now is interestingly sports. You perhaps you've seen there's been some golf initiatives of building uh, some series of golf in Saudi Arabia and soccer. So this is Vision 230. Stay tuned on what's going to play out there. Uh, MBS has done some very impulsive actions, uh, uh, behaved in some case, cases very cruelly, and in some cases just very recklessly. And these are some examples since 2017. They tried to kidnap the uh, Prime Minister of Lebanon. Prime Minister of Lebanon came to visit uh, Saudi Arabia and the leaders, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, wouldn't let him leave for a couple of weeks. He tried to delegitimize the government of Lebanon because he felt they were too much influenced by Iran. Uh, they did another crazy thing. They in invited to a Ritz Carlton a large Ritz-Carlton complex in Riyadh, they invited about two or 300 of the distant relatives and then um, blocked their exits and wouldn't let them leave for about a month or two. Uh, it, was, it was stated it was an anti-corruption action, but in fact, they forced the, uh, the, uh, all these crown princes to give up a lot of their wealth to, to Mohammed bin Salman. A uh, very, very reckless thing to do. Uh, they froze diplomatic tweets with Canada because they didn't like uh, relations, because they didn't like a, a tweet that was uh, put forth. They attacked Yemen. Horrible, horrible civil war now going on in Yemen. It's all Saudi Arabia's actions that did that because they didn't like the influence of Iran on Yemen. They isolated Qatar for a variety of reasons we can't get into. That lasted for about three years. And last but not least, horribly, horribly, they sponsored, it was a state-sponsored premeditated murder of a Saudi dissident journalist who worked for the Washington Post, and it was covered up, and his last name was Khashoggi, Jamash Khashoggi, perhaps you remember his name. He was murdered in the Saudi embassy in uh, Turkey. It was very gruesome. Apparently, they dismembered his body and ship things out. And it was just a very, very gruesome uh, situation. And at the time of his murder, he was waiting to become a uh, uh, an American citizen.
So it's a horrible action. So here's the question I ask all of you to think about. Is MBS a modernizer or a murderer? And sadly to say, it's kind of both. Uh, he can be impulsive. He can be flaky. He can be ruthless. He tolerates zero, I say zero dissent. He's very ambitious. He makes it clear that he is going to be the one in charge. Okay. And, uh, but on the other hand, he's kind of a visionary. He's a market reformer. He's a social reformer. He's done some good things on that in that area. As I said before, a supporter of a market economy. And here's the other gig. Remember, I told you that 70% of the people in Saudi Arabia are under 35. They really, he is has a heroic image to young Saudis. They absolutely love him, okay? Because they really see him as one of them. Interesting, as, as we proceed here. Let's start dabbling a little bit in history, okay? Abdul Aziz bin Saud, born in 1876, died in 1953. Abdul Aziz bin Saud was the founder of the country of Saudi Arabia. Uh, Abdul Aziz bin Saud had 22 wives. He had 44 sons, something like 50 or so daughters. Okay. And all of his sons, six of his sons have become president since he died in 1953. A couple of brief things about his life. He was the son of a local tribal chief in Riyadh. This was in um, the late 1800s in the desert. Riyadh was just a small village then. You can imagine things were like the same as they were 2,000 years prior to that. He never set foot in a school. His family was exiled by a rival tribe to Kuwait between 1891 and 1902. He was very tall, about six foot four, a fearless fighter, very charismatic, and he was a shrewd strategist. And the, what he did was he took advantage of an Arab culture of decentralized tribal units, and he conquered rival tribes over several decades, first taking over in Riyadh, then moving out throughout what is now Saudi Arabia, and finally, he took over the area along this a strip along the Red Sea that had previously part of the Ottoman Empire in 1925. And that's where Mecca was. So he conquered these tribes, and this is what he did. He strategically married uh, everywhere he went. And he was able to have up to four wives, and between marriages and divorces, he was able to strategically in some ways militarily, expand the breadth of his power. He negotiated pacts, and he also had strategic marriages to maintain and expand his power uh, throughout what is now Saudi Arabia, which, as you, I mentioned before, is a vast, vast body of land. He always had a bias of being anti-Persian. He was anti-Shia and anti-Ottoman. He was also, though, I want to stress, anti-British. He did not like or trust the British at all. He was serving the kind of shenanigans that they did in Iran and elsewhere in the Middle East, their lies. Uh, by and large, uh, Saudi Arabia stayed neutral during World War I and World War II. 1932, he decided to create a nation. Uh, here it is, 1932. He named it after his family. It was one of the poorest countries in the world at that time. Isn't that interesting? Its only source of income were the, was the pilgrimage to Mecca at that point in time. Uh, quickly, the world realized around World War I that oil was going to become a key resource militarily, uh, economically as well. In 1933, he made a contract with Standard Oil Company of California, which was Chevron. He was observing the relationship that Britain had with Iran. Britain also had a little bit of outreach to Saudi Arabia, but he would have nothing to do with Britain because of the way he observed their colonization and their racism towards the other colonies in the Middle East. And he decided early on 
that he was going to park his um, his future with the Americans. So the Americans got exploration votes, rights for 60 years. At that point in time in 33, there was not oil found then yet. 1938, they struck oil in Daman, which was a, an area on the uh, east coast, okay, near the Persian Gulf, the east coast of uh, Saudi Arabia. They established Saudi Arabia diplomatic relations, okay, with the United States. And the contrast was very unusual compared to the one-sided relationship that Iran and Britain, uh, uh, and Britain had. Britain was very heavy-handed. They had all the control. They only gave Iran 15% of the profits from their oil company in Iran. And they took all the rest. And in the United States, with, I'm sorry, in Saudi Arabia, the United States, it was always a 50-50 deal, always a 50-50 deal. And what happened was the Saudis, very, they were never nationalized or anything like that. The relationship over the years in running Aramco was relatively speaking pretty harmonious between the United States and Saudi Arabia. And there was not a problem really surfaced until the wars with Israel in the 60s and 70s. Saudi Arabia gradually bought the American shares until they were 100% owned by Saudis. But this is very interesting. The nature of the negotiations, when Iran tried to negotiate with Britain, it was just a non-starter. Britain refused to budge. They claimed that if they were thrown out, which they eventually were, then Britain would overthrow the government, would just take it over and colonize Iran. Um, this was uh, a very, very serious, hostile, friction-laden relationship. The United States and Saudi Arabia had negotiations over the years where they eventually, Saudi Arabia took it over. They were never confrontational. They were transactional. And Saudi Arabia bought the rest of, the, of Aramco at fair market value. It was finalized in the early 1980s, which I think is uh, very interesting. This is a very consequential meeting globally that took place in 1945 between Abdul Aziz and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was coming home from Yalta from a, uh, a, a summit meeting, and he stopped at, by the Suez Canal, and he met for a day, an afternoon, with uh, Abdul Aziz. And they talked about a lot of different things, but one very, very important thing which changed everything in the world was the deal that the United States made with Saudi Arabia. And this was a time when the Cold War was cropping up. The United States wanted to get as engaged as they could and uh, uh, and getting access to the oil, predictable oil at low prices. And Saudi Arabia wanted protection. They were very frightened of the Soviet Union. They made a pact. The U.S. made a pact with the royal family. If you support our energy needs and do it at a low price, we will not interfere in your domestic affairs ever, and we will provide you support for the defense of your country. And this is where defense for oil, that pact which, uh, which continued for 50, 60 years, with Saudi Arabia was truly finalized. And really, when you look back at this in context, it was a good deal for Saudi Arabia because they never have, have had, even to this day, a strong defense. And they were very worried about the Soviet Union. And the United States, on the other hand, um, this was an amazing thing to have access to cheap oil. An amazing thing to have access to cheap oil. So this was something that they took advantage of as well. And you know, when you think back, I thought about this a lot, when you think back about the 1950s and the great uh, prosperity in the United States in the 1950s, uh, you know, the suburbs being built, home ownership, things like that. A lot of the factors that go into that prosperity are thanks to cheap oil from Saudi Arabia. We have Saudi Arabia to thank for that. How many of you remember 
when, and I faintly do, remember when oil was 25 cents in a gallon, okay? Um, it was really something. And that had a huge impact on the overall lower cost of living from that. So with that, there's explosion, okay, of oil well in the 1950s and the 1960s. This is a very interesting, unique phenomenon in the history of economics, of economic society uh, in the world. In the 40s, um, it was a very nomadic society, very, very rural, small. Okay, oil was just starting to get uh, uh, to get uh, distributed dramatically. Then, all of a sudden, there's a transition. Huge revenues flowed out for Saudi Arabia. This was primarily in the 50s and 60s and 70s. What was going on here? This industry was built uh, in, a, in a country that had no internal skills on how to build oil infrastructure. They were dependent totally on the United States to help them to do this. So you've got the Saudi Arabians and you've got Western society. They really had, unlike in the United States and Western society, Western society, it, they had a phase industrialization over perhaps 300 years between the 18th century and the 21st century. They very, very gradually changed over into industrialized society. Saudi Arabia did not have that privilege. They had to get phased in 30 years. What took us 300 years took them only 30 years. And they were very, very dependent. And I want to stress this once again. This was a pretty good deal what the United States offered to the Saudis. Okay, so there was a good deal on both sides as this uh, actually played out. But it's very rare in any other society that there was a change quite like this. One other wrinkle in Saudi society I want to just talk about briefly. There are a group of Islamists known as the Wahhabis. It's a very, very conservative sect of Islam. There's a core ideology of Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia that are supported by the government, which is truly a code ideology of global terror. And they have historically, and it's not sure, but somehow there's some relationship between the government and exporting uh, madrasas, which are schools abroad of, of, of radical Islam. And this radical Islam is very, very insidious. It religiously sanctions the ability to kill, quote, non-believers, end quote, which could be Jews, Christians, Shias, Alawites, uh, uh, whomever. And a very, very good debatable question, which I think is certainly worthy of concern in American society as we try to untangle our relationship with Saudi Arabia, is sometimes a sense that the House of Saud is doing a double game. They pose as allies of the West and supporting the West in the war on terror. And at the same time, they're funding terrorist networks like Al-Qaeda and ISIS through these Wahhabi uh, networks abroad. I mean, it's kind of like, what, what's the deal? And here's a good debatable question. Is Saudi Arabia a victim or an exporter of extremist ideology? Okay, or is it both? Now, just think about that. That's, to me, a very, very unusual and good question to contemplate. Okay? Uh, another way to look at this is you've got this conflict. You've got this incredible, uncontrolled materialism versus a harsh religious orthodoxy. And how do you reconcile those two things? And I want to stress this point about materialism in Saudi society, because I don't believe it's quite realized the depth of the wealth that uh, Saudi oil has given to the leaders of the country of Saudi Arabia. There are, a, let's just say, about 300, uh, about 300 princes in the royal family right now, and they live on allowance. Every single one of them does. Now, I, didn't, I heard this about 10, 15 years ago. Not today, 
I believe these numbers are much lesser today. But as of 10, 15 years ago, each one of these crown princes was on a uh, an allowance every single month of, get this, $20 million. $20 million a month. I mean, it just boggles the mind, the, the kind of wealth that was going on there. I understand that right now, historically, that's gone down, and it's only more like 2 or $3 million a month, which still, to me, is not too bad. But just imagine that degree of wealth. When you're talking about the uh, the uh, um, valuation of a Ramco, remember, they're very secretive. We don't know what the valuation is, but it is absolutely, literally in the trillions, okay? So what you got here is you got Saudi Arabia's caught. They've got Iran that's exporting their Islamic revolution, and you've got the United States exporting its materialistic values. So there's sometimes a lot of friction back and forth. They don't know which end is what, but Saudi Arabia can still pull us off. Why is that? Because the country is so darn wealthy. It is just so, so darn wealthy. And uh, in normally in normal times, I would suggest that the country, uh, a country like this is right for our people. But I don't think it is now. I really don't. Let's move on to security. And here's where Iran comes in. But I started thinking about Iran. Okay. I wanted to compare and contrast these countries. Uh, Saudi security status, they're very, very, very rich. Much richer than Iran is. Because Iran's got all of these uh, um, uh, sanctions against them from the West, from the United States. But Saudi Arabia is very militarily, militarily vulnerable. Their army and navy is weak. It's obsolete. For some reason, they've decided because of the location, they're going to put their money on their air force. Air force is where they're going to put their money. So uh, this is where they buy a lot of the weapons. What do you think they buy all their weaponry from for the air force, for their, for their air force? United States of America, of course. The bottom line is, uh, the Saudi Arabia is very, very vulnerable because of its porous borders, which we outlined. And they're vulnerable to a large-scale attack, wherever that might come from. They're vulnerable from a cyber attack. They're vulnerable from a military attack from Iran at any point in time. And they also have internal threats from the sense of the, the all the Shia Muslims that are on the uh, uh, the East Coast by the areas where the oil fields are. So uh, Saudi Arabia is very wealthy, comfortable in some ways, precarious in the sense of uh, oil running out at some point, and also the whole issue about uh, oil fields, about the uh, um, uh, about Iran and what they could do militarily against Saudi Arabia. Flip side of that, I think it's fair to say Iran has no fear of a Saudi military threat. And remember, Saudi Arabia has always had the attitude that they would like, and um, uh, General David Petraeus made a quote once, uh, which I think is pretty insidious and yet true. He said that the Saudis are willing to go to war with Iran or anybody else and die to the last American. In other words, they'd love America to do, fight their battles for them, and also Israel. And therein lies the thrust of that normalization uh, uh, setting. Okay? So, in the normalization talks, I just got a couple slides left. In the normalization talks, these are things that Saudi Arabia is asking from the United States and Israel. Uh, this is a very interesting thing. The If normalization could be had between Saudi Arabia and Israel, this would be a huge, huge game changer. It is not uh, uh, as promising as it was prior to October 7th, but it's not dead. I absolutely, I am personally very, very hopeful that somehow something can get negotiated. Because uh, the United States wants this, Saudi Arabia wants this, and frankly, Israel wants this. So 
high-level weapons is something they want more weapons and more high-level weapons from the United States. Saudi Arabia does. Uh, Saudi Arabia would like the United States to build a civilian nuclear infrastructure. Ooh, a civilian military infrastructure. That's kind of scary. Do we want to give a nuclear program to the Saudis? What will that mean? Will the uh, uh, the Egyptians want it? Will uh, will Jordan want it? You know, what is that going to mean in the Middle East? Okay, so that's a, a big problem and concern. Next, uh, uh, defense treaty. They want a defense treaty just like NATO. That's really something different than what they have now. Um, in NATO, anybody in NATO who gets attacked, there's a promise that the United States will jump in and protect the country with the full force of the United States military. That's a that's quite a defense uh, uh, um, a guarantee. And uh, um, another thing about all of these to consider, first of all, you know, Israel doesn't have a defense treaty. Taiwan doesn't have a defense treaty. Only NATO does. And in order to approve a defense treaty, which is really problematic, is that um, it would have to get two thirds vote from Congress. Tell me something. Do you know anything in Congress these days with all the disagreements and the, the uh, partnership and and everything? Do you know of anything that can get two thirds majority agreement on? I don't. So I think this would be a big problem. The last thing, which is very contentious, and we're not gonna get into this today, We've done it in the past, and I'll be happy to talk about it in the future. Is the uh, uh, Saudis want a guarantee of um, steps towards the creation of a Palestinian state? And this is a very, very big thing in the Middle East, also. If this normalization could come about, this would be an absolute game changer for stability in the Middle East. Watch it carefully. I am watching it, and I'm very, very hopeful. But uh, uh, it's going to be a tough run road, uh, road to hoe. Okay, last two slides here. The United States and Saudi Arabia, let's talk about their relationship. They, interestingly enough, they have shared interests. What are their shared interests? They have a common enemy. The enemy is Iran. Most countries that have a common enemy find a reason to get together, especially in the Middle East. They do not, though, have shared values. The values of the uh, Saudis with, uh, let's just say, uh, 363 uh, beheadings a month last uh, year per month. Uh, those are just not things that the United States has. Uh, we don't uh, um, kill dissenting journalists, things like that. Uh, we're just not our value system. So that's a very good open debatable question. What's more important in deciding who our friends are? Is it common interests? or shared interests or shared values. I think that's a very good debatable point. For right now, we have this deal, protection for oil. There's a convenient partnership, but I wouldn't say that the United States and and, uh, uh, and Saudi Arabia are necessarily uh, allies. There are some benefactors in Washington which truly benefit from the, uh, the relationship between uh, the United States and Saudi Arabia. And these are them. Oil companies, obviously, they benefit dramatically. Arms dealers, obviously, and also financial institutions. So the highest level of capitalism, those titans of capitalism are the institutions that, that uh, benefit the, the very, very most, okay? By and large, the relationship with the United States is a trans transactional relationship. So summarizing, major session takeaways here. The relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia is complicated. It really is complicated. We don't need Saudi Arabia anymore. We have enough to take care of ourselves with oil in terms of Alaska, uh, Texas, Pennsylvania, other places, North Dakota. We don't need it, but Western Europe does. And if they were cut off, if Saudi Arabia cut off from Western Europe, they would be in a world of hurt. The EEU, or European Electronic Economics Union, has a very strong relationship with the United States. Uh, they would suffer, and our, um, our 401ks would suffer as well, just like theirs would. Uh, 
Another thing I think it's so interesting how they went from poverty to wealth in just 20, 30 years, and how the United States helped them do that. This is going to be a very interesting thing to watch over the next 30, 40 years. How can they diversify from oil? How well can they truly be successful in doing that? They have to do it. At some point, they're going to run out of oil. Uh, this friction between Westernization and Wahhabi Islam, how is that going to play out? Will Westernization and materialism kind of drown out Wahhabi Islam over time? I have my concerns about that. Remember, 15, 16 of the 20 9-11 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is something to remember. Despite all we said about the problems and issues in the future in Saudi oil, power of Saudi oil is still real. It's still there. It's still very, very real. And if you were to ask, what's the quest? What does Saudi Arabia really want? What they would really like to have, frankly, is regional stability, is people not to be at war with each other and for them not to have to worry about paying for all this weaponry. Okay, regional stability. That's what they want more than anything else. And with that, Kay, uh, I have 131, so I went over by one minute. Uh, I am going to open it up, and I'm happy to ask you for about any questions you have, uh, any thoughts about issues relative to normalization, uh, 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 the future of oil, uh, of, of, uh, of Islam, anything to do with the country of Saudi Arabia, or how it kind of views itself in comparison to their uh, competition with it, with Iran. Okay, well, it looks like um, most of our opening questions have to do with oil and the economy. So we'll start with those. Um, okay, just one thing in terms of talking about immediately right now, does the oil wealth accrue to the average citizen or only mainly to the royal family? They say that again. Does the oil wealth, I mean, does it is it kind of dispersed out to the workers, the average citizen, or does only the royal family getting Do you mean wealth? in terms of the money? Yeah. Oh, okay. Huh. Okay. The money. Um uh, the royal family, really the country, the country owns the uh 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 this is what I was trying to kind of lay out. The country owns the oil company, okay? The country owns the oil companies, but the oil companies, because of the control of the oil companies that Mohammed bin Salman has, they uh, they really get the money. They're the ones that benefit from the revenues. And we don't know how much that is. We just don't know how much that is and everything. But they're the ones that benefited. And what they do is they want to disperse just enough out to the people in terms of cradle-to-grave services, which to an average citizen is a good deal. You know, imagine to have uh, education, uh, uh, health care, uh, low energy costs, uh, free, uh, free services. They give them comfortable jobs and everything else. They benefit. But ultimately, the uh, the the revenue flows right from the top first, okay. and that's why there's always a question of the dynamic. Would it be plausible that the people would rebel against the royal family? That's been asked a lot, and I don't see it happening because mm -hmm. um, it's almost like they buy off the citizens. They kind of buy off the citizens. Yeah. Now, if okay, we're estimating it's that the oil is going to run out at some point, but we don't know when, because I'm sure they're not going to tell us. Um, could I, could I answer to that? Yeah. Um, I forgot to mention this. Um, I'm going to take a, um, a wild guess. And this is what I've told people publicly. My sense, nobody knows when exactly, but mm -hmm. my sense it will run out somewhere between 30 and 70 years from now. So probably not for all of us listeners and me included, I doubt I'll live to see that. <laughs> okay, but it's not that long ago. It's not going to be 200 years from now mm -hmm. out in the future. It's going, it's absolutely going to happen. And this is why it mystifies me why they didn't plan, start planning this earlier. 
Okay. They should have done this in the 80s and 90s, but now they're finally starting. Go ahead, Kay. I'm sorry. Right. No, because it's like, and also, I mean, with America moving towards a more green initiative and needing less oil, um, that's going to impact their economy, I would think, some. Well, no. Keep in mind, okay. all those phenomena you just state are going to happen all over the world. They're happening all over the world. So it's more than just them running out of oil. People are just not going to need it as much. I don't think that phenomenon will impact things materially for a while still. Okay. But that is also something that will happen. I didn't state that, but thank you for mentioning that. It's beyond just running out of oil. So does Saudi Arabia have any other industries out there other than oil? Do they make any consumer goods, other goods? Very, very little. There are lots of very astute entrepreneurs. If they could only do more to support and help, uh, most of the entrepreneurs are women okay. because they can't get into the workforce. So they start their own businesses. And there are some very, very interesting businesses. And that is also why... Mohammed bin uh, that's why he is interested in getting a relationship with Israel because he really, really wants to tap in to some of the technological resources that Israel has. One of the things I'll give you an example, besides high tech, uh, Israel is world renowned in making agriculture work in a water deprived climate. And Saudi Arabia would love to get access to their secrets. And one of the first things, I guarantee you, one of the first things that will happen if there is a full-fledged normalization is that thousands of Israeli farmers will get shipped out to Saudi Arabia to help them to start something. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they're very, very hungry. Also, they have high tech, and also they think is, uh, Saudi Arabia is worried. This is a whole other story about China and what uh, the, they worry about whether or not the United States is going to withdraw from the region. Sometimes they've made some noises about that. They're very frightened about that. Who will protect them then? They can't get stopped by Iran. They think the Israelis can. Uh, okay, so we talked about, you mentioned women being um, the entre entrepreneurs currently. Um, yes. You were saying that the population is only 42% women, which seems slightly out of proportion to what a lot of other nations are. Generally, it's closer to 50 or maybe even more than the men, but why is it disproportionately you know, lower? I, I, you know, I, I have, a, these are guesses, okay? okay? These are just educated guesses. You know, and this is almost criminal for me to say, but in Saudi Arabia, men's lives are valued. Women's lives aren't. And I'm wondering if that just goes out into, uh, you know, issues related to, to health care, to, to other things along those lines. Um, we know that in China, for example, when they created this one child policy, what do you think Chinese families wanted to have, men or women? Men. They wanted men. Yep. And so what did they do with the women? They shipped them to adopted to America. Notice that American adoptees from China were never men. They were always women. And these are some sad commentaries of all of this. I do understand what you're saying. It seems a little bit um, very out of the loop. Uh, mm -hmm. And it has kind of skewed society. This disproportion is really off the charts in China. There are countries there um, it's unbelievable. I heard a story of a village in China, about eight or 10,000 people. They have between, of marriageable ages, between 20 and 25 years old, they have something like 800 men and something like 11 women. You know, it's a very screwy kind of a thing there. And um, uh, so I'm not really sure if there's a little bit of that phenomenon. I think some of that is. The good news is, I think a lot of that's changing. And uh, as the market economy is more driven, I think entrepreneurs will be even more appreciated. I think women will get even more and more independence. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman is encouraged women driving now. This is a screwy thing. There are some well-known 
uh, entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs in Saudi Arabia now, and they still are suffering under the guardianship system and have to wait to be driven by their older brother or something. Mm -hmm. It's just, and yet they've got a lot of power. And yet within their family construct, they have very little. It's a very weird thing. And I'm hopeful that that will flesh out pretty quickly because I think that'll be for the better betterment of Saudi society. And, you know, the other thing that, um, um, that damages the role of women in society generally is this insidious um, uh, Wahhabi Islamism, which is very, very conservative. And uh, we all know what happens in those kind of uh, roles and things. So I am hopeful that, that things will change for the, for the positive over time here. Okay, so we know in terms of like the normalization thing that Saudi Arabia would love to work with Israel. How does Israel feel about working with Saudi Arabia? Israel would love to work with Saudi Arabia, except for one thing, and that's a Palestinian state. Okay. And um, it's very maddening to me and very frustrating to me. I've given talks on a two-state solution, and I'm happy to do that in the future if any of you are ever interested on why it's so hard, and I can get into a lot of depth there. But what does that mean to Israel if they got normalization with Saudi Arabia? The Israeli war with the Sunni Arab world, not the Shia Arab world, but mm -hmm. the Sunni Arab world, which has been going on since day one of Israel's existence, would be over. It would be over. Uh, there would be no longer a war between any of those Arab countries in the Arab world uh, and Israel. It would just, there still would be the conflict with Iran, but it would uh, de-escalate that dramatically if uh, Iran always knows. And, and this is what the phenomenon of Iran and, so, and, the United, and Israel uh, has been very, very, uh, I'm sorry, yes, in Iran and Israel has been very, very interesting. But as in some ways, they've pushed the United, uh, Israel closer to the Arab world. And remember, there's been friction there. When that attack took place about two months ago, you may recall Iran attacked Israel, something like 1,500 missile attacks or something, and so many of them were shot down. About 70% of them were shot down by Israel. About 25% were shot down by, uh, by the United States. And this is not very well known because uh, Saudi Arabia... You know, they've been talking to is uh, quietly to Israel for a long time, but mm -hmm. uh, at least five or six of the Iranian missiles were actually shot down by Saudi Arabia. They will not announce that. They won't let that be known. But they're helping. They want to help Israel against Iran because, as we've talked about, is uh, they're afraid of Iran. So there is a benefit, though, from Israel as well because this is a source of markets and they wouldn't mind at all getting tapping into all that Saudi wealth, which now they're tapping into the United Arab Emirates, but they're able to tap into it as well. So there is a lot of benefit for Israel as well to make this happen. I am very hopeful. Uh, the price for making it happen has gone up because of the October 7th attacks, but the talks are not dead. Okay. Um... Let's see. How could the mismatch between a deeply transactional negotiation-based relationship between Saudi Arabia and the U.S. Um, and a future Saudi king who has no experience with or inclination towards negotiation, how do you think? I mean, because the heir does not sound like he's really had any negotiation okay. training. Um. Very good point. That is true. Uh, what I was saying, and I probably didn't stress this point, most of his impulsive, flaky, aggressive actions mm -hmm. took place between 2017 and 2022. I am of the opinion that he's getting to be a little bit more astute okay. and educating himself 
to behave like a better global citizen. Unfortunately, what also is, is becoming clear is he's learning how to leverage his power of oil and of wealth. So that makes him in some ways a more difficult diplomatic partner, mm -hmm. but uh, he's less, he seems less inclined. How else do I say this? He's less inclined to do stupid things. I don't know how else to say it. And somehow it seems like he's just not as impulsive like he was five years ago. Okay. To just go out and invade a country or do something similar like that. He's getting a little bit of uh, of savvy and learning some things and, and doing some things a little bit smarter. Okay. I'm hopeful of that anyway. So, okay. Going to look at some internal things in terms of can Saudi Arabia produce its own food? Um, no, I mean, but right now, not much. It's uh, certainly not agriculture. It can't. That whole equation could change if it got a, uh, a relationship with Israel. Israel has a huge harmonious relationship within agriculture with many, many countries in Africa. They send a lot of, um, of farmers to Africa to help them run farms and get things started in countries like Ethiopia, uh, uh, Tanzania, places like that. Uh, my son works in agriculture in Israel, so I know this for a fact, mm -hmm. that they do a lot of this. This is exactly what Saudi Arabia would love to, to tap into. Right now, uh, they, they buy most of their food. They've got the money for it. You know where they buy a lot of their food from China? Okay. China can produce it cheaply. So they buy a lot of that. Um, I'll tell you what, Kay, another uh, possible topic for a, a talk someday, and I thought about this with Ali, is the impact of China on the Middle East. They've, they've got their tentacles in everywhere in the Middle East. And the United States doesn't like that. Go ahead. Yeah, well, in terms of China, where who supplies most of their oil? Would it be Saudi China's Arabia? oil? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, Saudi Arabia uh, supplies a lot of it, and also Iran supplies a lot of it. Okay. Iran yeah. supplies a lot of it. China is trying to play, I'll give away a little bit here, they're trying to play a little bit of a middle ground here and not show any favorites. Both Iran and Saudi Arabia wish that, that China would side with them. They mm -hmm. really wish they would, but they won't. And they're, they're willing to go on both sides and... Uh, uh, China, uh, the United States is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Saudi Arabia is very scared of the United States leaving the area. And they have talked to China about wanting, if the United States leaves, of China coming in and protecting them. And China has taken the attitude that we'll do business with all these countries, but we are not going to be the def defenders like the United States has. We will not do that. So it's a very interesting dynamic that's playing out. Okay, looking at the elections coming up, I know- um, Where, in the United States? Yeah, in the United States. Okay. Um, I know, just not to get political or anything, but I know that when Trump came into office, one of the things he did not do was go to Saudi Arabia as his first foreign visit, which seems to be a precedent that's been set by previous ones. And they, an article from Global Decision or for Great Decisions, um, saying that they then put sanctions on. Um, sorry. Attention, guys, please visit us at the front desk. Thank you. Let me get, let me get, give you clarity on that. Um, Trump's first foreign visit was to Saudi Arabia. Was it? It was to Saudi Arabia. Jared Kushner. And Ahmed bin Salman, our real buddy buddy. Okay. You know, they're just they're both uh, uh spoiled rich boys. And uh they they're very, very buddy buddy. And uh, um and it's it's a very interesting dynamic because Jared Kushner is also an Orthodox Jew who has a lot of ties to uh to Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel as well. But that's neither here nor there. They went Trump went to Saudi Arabia. Uh Probably 
I would guess that Saudi Arabia would be happy if Trump got elected because um, um, Biden is a little bit more focused in his values in um, in democratization. And Trump doesn't care about that in his relationship with the other with other countries. And so Trump will probably uh, I would think that uh, uh, that uh, he and he Trump has also been very pro Saudi Arabia and anti Iran. Remember, Trump got rid of the Iran nuclear deal, which I will tell you, I think was a huge mistake, but it's done and it's over with. I'm not going to judge that or anything. But uh, uh, he had a huge, uh, and Trump was very anti-Iran. He got out of the Iran nuclear deal. And um, I don't believe that the Iran nuclear deal was not working. I thought it was working. Uh, but Trump always had the attitude of this was Obama's thing. It was bad. So he did what he did. And he also, though, put sanctions on Iran. It's very interesting to me that Biden has not lifted many of those sanctions. Uh, Trump put this big anti-Iran thing in and Biden tried to negotiate, but he has not really gotten rid of a lot of those sanctions. And he has been probably friendlier to Saudi Arabia than people expected him to be. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of things, no, neither Democrat or Republican will be willing to admit this, but there are some things that Trump did in the Middle East that Biden hasn't changed much. And if you ask Trump, he would totally... You know, no way, no way. I'm much different. They haven't been that different. Okay. I find that also very, very interesting that mm -hmm. that has played out. Iran is still a problem. They're still kind of our enemy. And the relationships with Saudi Arabia and uh, and um, and the United States has been pretty good the last three, four years, actually. Okay. Um, one person is asking, is Saudi Arabia buying up U.S. farmland to address its own food security issues? Um, no, I don't think so. There is some of that. Um, you know, the issue that worries appropriately a lot of Americans, and you could say this about Saudi Arabia, you could say this about the Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, I, often get, uh, I often get posed this question about China. And the question is, and you can relate the same thing to Saudi Arabia. Is there a chance in China that, um, you know, 5 million troops could land on the West Coast, try to conquer our country? And I said, that's absolutely implausible. I had some people say, I'm worried about that. And I said, that's absolutely implausible. What is plausible, and this is a source of worry, if you were to tell me that 70% of all the real estate in downtown LA is owned by the Chinese, that's plausible. Right now, that number is maybe 20%. In Vancouver, it's over 50%. Same thing to go with, uh, with, with Saudi Arabia in terms of real estate. They own a lot of real estate in the United States. They also own a lot, and this is a cause of worry. They own, they have commissioned lots and lots and lots of educational chairs in our great universities at Stanford, at Harvard, at UPenn. You know, um, I don't want them to be in control of what our, uh, our very smart children are learning. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And uh, frankly, um, I don't know where the balance is, but they have a lot of ownership of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I don't think it's more than five, 10 percent, but they have something if that ever gets to 50 percent, I'd be worried. So that's the one thing I think that with respect to all these other wealthy countries, and it's primarily China, but also Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates or whatever, I don't want external resources having ownership of important institutions in the United States mm -hmm. or real estate. That to me is the biggest risk that we should watch in the coming decades, is the economic creep of some of these countries where the United States loses control. That's kind of going to be the new competition, I think. 
Okay. Sorry, I went off on a little tangent there about China, but it's the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, okay, since we talked about food and we stated that there's no rivers and there's no lakes, where do no they lakes. get right? Where do they get their fresh water from? Uh, there are oases here, there, and everywhere. Uh, there are water uh, salinization kind of plants. Once again, there is a perfect example of where if they got could tap into the expertise from Israel, because Israel is world class in these technologies. Once again, they live. They have a lot of desert. They live in global uh, water deprived climates. They make they make agriculture very very profitable. Mm -hmm. So uh, they have a lot of very state-of-the-art salinization plants. Uh, Saudi Arabia is getting into that to some extent. Who knows? Maybe they're already talking quietly. I wouldn't be surprised if they are talking quietly and not letting people know and sharing ideas and things like that. This is where this normalization talk is very, very, who knows how those negotiations will go. Okay. There's another dynamic I'll tell you about the election, which you'll find humorous. I think that Biden really wants to get this normalization deal, even if it's some formula or in something like that formulaic thing done, is so that he can declare a diplomatic victory before the election. Maybe. So who knows? Do you think, okay, I remember we talked about how Iran, the youth were very internet savvy yes. in Iran. Is the same true in Saudi Arabia? Yes. I would just say that throughout the Middle East, there is a high proportion, proportion of youth. Okay. And um, um, probably that proportion of youth is even higher in Iran than Saudi Arabia. But remember, I wrote to the other, it's very, very interesting to me, that youth in Saudi Arabia, MBS is a heroic figure. Mm -hmm. They think of him as one of us. Think of Iran, they're run by a bunch of old fuddy-duds that are all old clerics that are, were occupying the revolution and everything. And so when you compare, um, let's do a couple of comparisons because this is supposed to be one versus the other. The stability of the two countries the stability of Saudi Arabia is probably even better than the stability of Iran, I would say. Because uh, the youth, they have a youthful leader who's going to be there for 50 years. And um, uh, the as far as internet savvy, I would say perhaps Iran is a little more internet savvy. A lot of the reasons for that is that their government is so anti-United States and Western world that they uh, rebel against that. Mm -hmm. And um, they really, really are enamored with the West. Uh, I would say that the they are also in Saudi Arabia, but I'd say even more so, it's a little more noteworthy in Iran because their youth is so opposed to the government. They don't like the government in Iran. We talked about that last week. They don't like the government. So the government is shaky. I just hope, hope, hope that nobody, and I mentioned this last week, I hope that no foreign governments try to, uh, if there's an upheaval in Iran, it's got to come from within. We can't make that happen. That just gets the United States in trouble. They uh -huh. always screw it up when they try to overthrow a government. So, I mean, is we talk, is there any unrest? in the from the youth or women at all in Saudi Arabia I mean are Saudi they... Arabia the only unrest is uh it's not really from there are some isolated things from women they are uh, uh it's being quashed quashed by the government pretty fast hmm. if there's any fear that the government has of unrest I would say that it comes more from the small Shia population in the West, I'm sorry, in the east of the country. And just remember that Shia population is in the same proximity as the oil fields. So I have often wondered if there would ever be a terrorist attack or something like that 
And the other thing that's very interesting is Bahrain, which is an island right off the coast. Mm -hmm. There's a 15 mile causeway between the, the, the mainland of Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. Bahrain is has a uh, leadership that is primarily Sunni, very friendly with the royal family, but the government is majority uh, Shia. So there's always worry about an instability there. Mm -hmm. And in fact, after nine, uh, the uh, uh, Arab Spring, the Saudis actually brought Air, uh, Arab troops over into Bahrain to make sure that everything was fine and to protect the uh, the leader of Bahrain. Bahrain is a very, very small island. Oh. Okay, there's still a lot of questions that we didn't get to, um, some that were just asked, but it is two o'clock and I wanna thank um, Henry for just a really, really interesting discussion these past two weeks. The information that you've shared with us has been really insightful and um, I just hope that we'll be able to have you come back sometime and talk. Sure. And otherwise, um, next week, we have a live in-person um, thing at Roseville Lutheran Church, where we'll have um, Tim Johnson, a professor at the U, talking about the 2023-2024 Supreme Court decisions. So if you're not signed up for that, there's still some time to sign up through the library. But otherwise, thanks everyone and have a good afternoon. Thank you everybody, I appreciate your interest.